Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel. Now today's video, we're going to be talking about thermal interface materials or thermal compounds, liquid metals, where it's safe to use them, where it's not safe to use them, whether you need to reapply them after a few months, all of that stuff. Now there's a bunch of videos around on YouTube showing CPUs that have been delitted and they found that when they've pulled them apart again, the thermal compound is all hardened and it needs to be reapplied. They found that the temperatures go up all sorts of crazy stuff like that. And what I want to do in this video is explain to you guys exactly how all the science works behind this so that instead of just watching a video on YouTube and saying, oh, well, it happened to this guy, so it's going to happen to this one, what you need to understand is there's a bunch of different variables here. Different types of metals react differently. Different brands react differently. All sorts of things like that. So what I want to do with this video is inform you guys on the science behind it all so that you can make informed decisions on the way you go with your own build. So I'm not going to mention any brand names in this video. I, I I want to sort of steer right away from that because I don't want it to come across as an endorsement for any particular brand. Obviously, I'm not affiliated with any brand. This isn't a sponsored video. This is just my own experience through doing my own research. Having said that, I have spoken with engineers from a few different companies to, to really get to the bottom of all this because I'm not a chemist myself. I'm not a scientist. I'm just an enthusiast and a bit of a geek that loves to really, really understand this stuff before I jump in and tinker with my own gear so that I don't make mistakes. So by the end of this video, you should be fully armed with all the knowledge that you need to make a decision on what thermal compound you're going to use between your um, heat spreader on your CPU and your um, CPU cooler and what type of thermal interface material you're going to use if you delid your CPU as well. So let's get stuck into it. Now, the first First thing that we need to understand is exactly what the role of a thermal interface material or a thermal compound is inside a system build. So basically what you've got is your CPU, which that's just a heat spreader from my CPU, but the CPU looks like that. You've got a surface on the top there and that surface needs to be cooled. So the heat's coming from the CPU, it's coming through the surface here. Now obviously there's not enough surface area within the CPU itself to cool it efficiently. The heat's going to build up very, very quickly. So what we need is a heat sink or a water block or something like that to actually cool this surface down. So basically all that is is a bigger chunk of metal which draws the heat away from this surface to cool it down and dissipates it out into the air or into the water or whatever it is. And obviously different designs have different fins and you know different things like that that allow them to cool more efficiently or you know quietly or whatever. That's not really important for this video. What we need to understand is simply that putting a big block of metal on here and cooling it is what draws the heat away from the CPU. So setting that aside for now, the, if you were to mount a CPU cooler directly to your CPU with no thermal paste or no thermal interface material, what would happen is because the two surfaces, so the surface of the CPU and the surface of your cooler aren't completely perfect, they've got little tiny pits and valleys in them at a microscopic level as well as things like impurities and stuff like that. So what happens is you get little tiny bits of air trapped in between the two, in, in between the two surfaces and the heat can't penetrate that barrier as effectively as it can with a proper thermal interface material or thermal compound. So what happens is you don't get a good interface between the two surfaces and the CPU continues to overheat because the heat's not getting transmitted or transferred through to the cooler correctly. So the thermal interface material is what is designed to simply create the interface between the two materials and transfer the maximum amount of heat possible through so that you get more efficient cooling on your CPU. So Effectively, what you want to do is have the thinnest layer possible of interface material. All it's really wanting to do is just fill those little tiny pits and valleys and imperfections in the surfaces. It doesn't transmit or conduct the heat as effectively as the metals do themselves. So if you have a really, really thick layer of thermal paste sitting there, the heat's going to hit that and it's not going to transmit through as effectively as it would if you just had the other metal surface really, really close with just little imperfections filled with the thermal compound. So that's why we always say it's good to use as small amount of um, thermal compound as possible without with well, while still maintaining a good spread of thermal compound across the entire surface. So ideally you want to have as small amount as possible but still complete coverage on the top. So now you understand the role of the thermal interface material and how to actually install it. What we need to look at is the different types and how they can be used and whatnot. So let's start talking a little bit more about that. 
So the same basic principles also apply when you're delitting a CPU as well. So a lot of people talk about the toothpaste that Intel uses on their CPUs now, and that's that's part of the problem. It's not the best um, it's not the best thermal compound in the world, but the main reason why there are temperature issues on the latest Intel CPUs is more due to the actual design of the CPU itself. So when manufacturers mount their heat spreaders onto their CPUs, what they actually do is they have a small layer of silicon or glue that sits underneath the heat spreader. And what that does is it raises the heat spreader up very, very, very slightly. So what happens is you actually end up with a thicker layer of interface material between the die and the heat spreader than you do when you've delitted the CPU. So when you delit a CPU, and you'll see if you go back and watch my deliting video, you're actually dropping that heat spreader down. So it's pretty much completely on top of the die. There's only a very, very, very thin layer, which is exactly what we're trying to achieve here. So part of the reason why the temperatures drop is because you're using a more conductive thermal interface material, usually liquid metal, but uh, the bigger part of the reason is that actually you're dropping the IHS down so that you've got a much thinner layer and therefore you've got more conductivity between the two. So they're the two things that combine together to make delitting drop your temperatures significantly. So the next thing that we need to talk about now is the various different types of thermal interface material that are available. So most people will be familiar with your normal sort of thermal pastes like Arctic Silver, Conductor Nort, Grizzlies, you know, all those kinds of ones. We won't go into all the brands now, but there's everybody's got their favorite one that they've tried and tested and you know they all perform pretty closely to each other and there's tables available on the internet where you can download and see you know people that have done tests back to back with various different thermal interface materials under controlled conditions to see exactly how they perform and you'll see the sort of top five or six or so most popular brands all perform within a degree or two give or take between them all so as long as you're choosing one of those top tier brands you're pretty much guaranteed to get good performance now where it gets complicated is a lot of people like to use liquid metals on either delitting or sometimes even on their CPUs between their CPU and the heatsink. Now, what you need to be aware of is that most liquid metals have a much higher thermal conductivity rating than your regular thermal compounds do. So that's the reason why they're popular. They transmit more heat, they create a better quality interface and you end up with a much lower temperature as a result. The trade-off of that is that most liquid metals contain gallium, which reacts very, very, very dangerously with aluminium. It actually eats the oxide layer away from aluminium and causes it to completely corrode and you may have seen videos I think Linus Tech Tips did a video where they actually used um, used a gallium based liquid metal on a I think it was a coke can or something like that and it completely ate the thing away and it's quite scary because if you drip a little bit onto your CPU case or parts of your motherboard that contain aluminium it can actually slowly penetrate through and break down the whole thing almost like rust it's very very scary okay so aluminium aside because we know that liquid metal and aluminium definitely do not mix the majority of water blocks CPU CPU coolers, so heat sinks and um, IHSs or heat spreaders on CPUs are made out of either pure copper, nickel plated copper, and the stock IHS on an Intel CPU is made out of nickel plated copper, and, or, or nickel itself, so nickel as a metal without any plating or any coating whatsoever. So because these different metals have different electrochemical potentials, they react with the gallium in different ways and at different speeds. So if you've ever seen a video of a IHS pulled off a CPU that's had um, liquid metal in it or a heat sink that's taken off a CPU, CPU that's had liquid metal underneath it, you might have noticed the staining that can happen on the surface of the copper or on top of the nickel. Now, you'll find that generally people that have used a nickel metal, they'll find it's only a slight staining and usually it can be removed pretty easily. If they've used pure copper, it's a lot more difficult to remove and it leaves this kind of tarnished gray looking stain on the metal. So what's actually happening when this hardening occurs is that the gallium inside the liquid metal is actually creating an alloy with the nickel or with the copper and filling all those little pits and valleys inside the copper that we spoke about earlier, creating a completely even surface. And the key important thing, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, it is the fact that this alloy that's created is still a better conductor of thermal energy than a solder or a thermal paste. So even though you're getting this hardening effect, doesn't necessarily mean that the thermal conductivity is going to be reduced. And in fact, the leading brands of liquid metal compounds are actually designed with this in mind. They're actually designed with the right mix of various different metals inside the compound so that when this hardening does occur, it's actually a design feature. It's actually meant to do this. So the copper gallium alloy isn't as good a conductor of heat 
as the pure metal would be, so as pure nickel or pure copper. But the key thing to remember here is that it's still a much better thermal conductor than solder or thermal paste. So even though this hardening occurs, it's still better than a soldered CPU or a CPU using thermal paste. So just because hardening occurs doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing as long as you're using a good quality liquid metal that is designed with this in mind. So if you're using a liquid metal that's just pretty much pure gallium, the hardening can leave behind residues that does diminish the thermal conductivity. And that's the reason why sometimes when people pull apart a CPU that's been diluted with a lower quality liquid metal, you do get that hardening effect and you do see the temperatures have begun to rise over time. If you're using a good quality liquid metal, it really isn't a problem that this hardening occurs. So I really want you to understand that when you see these videos online saying, oh no, my, my liquid metal hardened over time and it's rubbish, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to reapply it. And what you'll find is that over time, if you keep reapplying it, what's happening is you're actually just building a layer upon layer upon layer of the, um, of the gallium, which isn't as good a thermal conductor as the, um, as the pure copper would have been in its pure form anyway. And as we know from the earlier part of this video, you want to have as thin a layer as possible in this. So again, the liquid metal itself isn't replacing the copper or the nickel inside your heat spreader or CPU block. All it's doing is replacing the air that is created by the unevenness in the surface and replacing that with gallium or whatever the compound is that's in your liquid metal to create the perfect thermal conductivity between the two surfaces. So it's really not necessarily a problem if your liquid metal does harden over time. What's important is to make sure that you're using a quality liquid metal that has been formulated with this process in mind. So that's the reason why I don't have a problem with using liquid metal with my pure copper IHS on my CPU. Now, the other important thing to note here is that liquid metals don't necessarily give you much better performance between a heat spreader and a CPU block simply because you've got a much larger surface area, larger surface area and the thermal conductivity with a normal thermal paste is actually pretty good between the two. So you might see a very slight reduction in temperatures using a liquid metal, but when you weigh up the risk considering the amount of aluminium that's in the immediate area surrounding the CPU, so the mounting bracket and that kind of thing, in my opinion, it's really not worth using liquid metal between your heat spreader and your um, and your CPU cooler. It's just not worth the risk. The, the reduction in temperatures are very, very, very small. Unless you're really edging for that one degree or two degrees there, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of benefit as opposed to the sort of 15 to 20 and sometimes even up to 30 degree drop that you'll get from using liquid metal underneath your heat spreader between the die and the heat spreader itself. So there you have it, guys. That's a bit of the science behind this. Now, if you do want to know more about the electrochemical potential and things like that, what the actual values of the various different metals are. I'm happy to discuss it a little bit more in the comments. I want to keep this as basic as I can to give you the fundamental understanding of all this stuff because frankly, I'm sick of seeing these videos on YouTube that show one person's experience with one particular product and then sort of saying this is a blanket rule and this is the way it applies to every single product across every single type of metal because it simply doesn't work that way. So hopefully this video has given you the knowledge to go into this, do your own research, figure out what products you want to use for your own system and do it with confidence, not have to worry about pulling things apart every couple of months to check it. I want you guys to enjoy your computers. I want you guys to have fun and not be stressing about things that you really don't need to stress about. So I hope you found the video interesting and useful. As always, if you have, please do hit that like button, hit the subscribe button too, so you don't miss the next video. And of course the notification button too. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.